evening, everyone. So I was tasked to discuss how COVID-19 changed dengue diagnosis. Does it really change? So early signs and symptoms of dengue and COVID-19 could be similar. So making it a risk that patients may be wrongly diagnosed early in the course of disease. There's a risk that dengue and COVID-19 could overwhelm healthcare systems, not just in our country, but across the uh, multiple countries. So we were taught that arriving at a certain diagnosis of open, is often complex involving multiple steps, taking an appropriate history of symptoms and collecting relevant data. We have to perform a complete physical examination before generating a provisional and differential diagnosis and before ordering laboratory testing or diagnostic tests. At the beginning of 2020, we are faced with unprecedented public health challenges. A novel strain of coronavirus, later identified as severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2, has spread globally, marking another pandemic of coronaviruses. The viral disease is responsible for devastating pneumonia, named coronavirus disease of 2019 or your COVID-19, and projected to persist until the end of the year. In tropical countries like Philippines, however, concerns arise regarding the similarities of COVID-19 with other infectious diseases due to same chief complaint, which is fever. One of the infectious diseases of primary concern is dengue infection, which is now on its peak season. So the, the, the objective of my talk is to know the importance of knowing similar clinical presentations and pathophysiology of COVID-19 and dengue fever, to know the diagnostic tests for COVID-19 and dengue fever, to emphasize why excluding dengue or COVID-19 in the differentials in the setting of a pandemic is imprudent. So let's review first the differences between the two as to the structure, okay? So your SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope positive sense RNA virus that belongs to the beta coronavirus genus. Its diameter is 65 to 125 nanometers, contain a single strand of RNA, and it's coated by a crown-like spikes on its outer surface. That, that's why it's called or it's termed corona. While your dengue virus is one of the viral hemorrhagic fever that belongs to Flaviberi Day family, and its structure is smaller than SARS-CoV-2. Its diameter is 15 nanometers, and it contains a single-stranded RNA2. So SARS-CoV-2 has four main structural proteins, including spike glycoprotein, nucocapsid protein, an envelope glycoprotein, a membrane glycoprotein and your nucleocapsid protein. So this nucleocapsid protein is responsible for the viral genome and viral replication cycle. The dengue virus does not have spike protein, but has three main structural proteins, uh, protein genes, including your nucleocapsid or core protein, your membrane glycoprotein and envelope protein. So dengue virus has seven non-structural protein genes in which is your NS1 diagnostic and pathologic importance in the confirmation of dengue infection. So as to transmission, COVID, we all know that COVID is transmitted by a person to person through respiratory droplets that are spread when an infected person coughs, sneezes or talks. While in dengue, you no, know, it's a vector borne disease, mainly transmitted to people through the bites of infected Aedes species mosquitoes, like your Aedes aegypti and your Aedes albopticus. As to prevention, uh, these are infographics by the Department of Health on how to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 and dengue. And we have seen other ways earlier this year, aside from those ways mentioned by the DOH, we have your disinfecting sprays that are not actually are not acceptable and indiscriminate fogging when it's not endemic. But we can use mosquito nets as self-protection measures for dengue, but unfortunately, 
it will not protect us from COVID-19. So COVID and dengue infection are hard to distinguish because they, are, they have similar clinical features. For the incubation period, COVID-19 is thought to extend to 14 days with a median of four to five days from exposure to symptom onset. While the incubation period for dengue ranges from three to 10 days, typically five to seven days. So the clinical course or the clinical manifestation of both dengue and COVID-19 can range from mild to critical. So as Dr. Abinali discussed, I am showing you the clinical course of dengue where common symptoms like fever and, other, and others usually last two to seven days during febrile phase, where we usually catch our dengue patients and may be similar to COVID-19. Moreover, there are some misdiagnosed cases of dengue suspected patients that later confirm to be SARS-CoV-2 infection. Here, we present a number of COVID-19 symptoms and their similarities with dengue. So most patients with confirmed COVID-19 have fever or acute respiratory illness. However, various um, other symptoms have been associated with COVID-19. The list is not conclusive of all reported symptoms. These symptoms are also not specific for COVID-19 and the predictive value of a single symptom in the diagnosis of COVID-19 is uncertain. A study done by Henrina and company that uh, regarding the proportion of clinical manifestation differences between COVID-19 and dengue patient, fever is the most common chief complaint in both dengue fever and COVID-19 patients. In COVID-19, headache is an uncommon clinical presentation. Musculoskeletal symptoms present variably in COVID-19 patients and cough is the most common respiratory symptom in addition to fever and usually presents in the first two until the fourth day of illness. It is noteworthy that patients with COVID-19 can present with gastrointestinal symptoms such as your diarrhea, abdominal pain, vomiting, and nausea. Cutaneous involvement in viral diseases in, in, uh, is a common phenomenon including COVID-19. One patient was initially mistaken with um, dengue infection due to skin rash presenting as PTK and laboratory findings of thrombocytopenia. So I'm now showing you the pathophysiological similarities between uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever and COVID-19. Plasma leakage, thrombocytopenia, and coagulopathy are the hematological hallmarks of dengue hemorrhagic fever and COVID-19. Both dengue virus and SARS-CoV-2 induce the activation of your immune cells leading to the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as your tumor nucleosis factor and your interleukin-6. So this event promotes increased vascular permeability that leads to plasma leakage. In dengue hemorrhagic fever cases, the destruction of platelets in the peripheral region by dengue virus has been suggested as the cause of thrombocytopenia, which in the end culminates as coagulopathy, DIC, and in some cases results in the death. So while thrombocytopenia was also evident in COVID-19 patients, pathophysiological mechanism on how such event has occurred remain to be elucidated. Current data indicating that endothelial damage coupled with platelet apoptosis and impaired bone marrow growth might be the drivers of thrombocytopenia and coagulopathy in SARS-CoV-2 infected patients. The sequential pathophysiological process leads to the occurrence of DIC and the death of COVID-19 patients remains to be demonstrated. Still from the study of Henrina and company, the proportion of laboratory findings differences between COVID-19 and dengue patients, thrombocytopenia is more prevalent in COVID-19 patients compared to thrombocytosis. It is possible that SARS-CoV-2 causes leukopenia, 
through the same pathom mechanism of thrombocytopenia, which is bone marrow suppression. Leukopenia in dengue hemorrhagic fever or dengue fever is attributed to the fact that dengue virus causes myeloid progenitor cell destruction and inhibition. So in COVID-19, the pathom mechanism of lymphopenia is still unknown, whereas in pathom mechanism of lymphopenia, in dengue infection have three pathways. We have a direct infection of dengue virus to the hematopoietic progenitor cells, activated dengue specific T cells and marrow stromal cells infection by dengue virus that result to marrow suppression of cytokines. In addition, dengue virus can cause generalized bone marrow suppression leading to lymphopenia. COVID-19 patients showed increased levels of D-dimer. D-dimer levels were elevated in dengue patients as well. So the D-dimer is used for prognostic study for predictive of severe dengue or dengue hemorrhagic fever. So uh, comparing dengue virus or dengue, dengue fever from coronavirus with regards to the severity, in COVID-19, among patients who develop severe disease, the medium time to dyspnea range from five to eight days. The median time to acute respiratory distress or ARDS range from eight to 12 days. And the median time to ICU admission range from 10 to 12 days. So these are the signs and symptoms for severe illness, includes your dyspnea, hypoxia, leading to respiratory failure. Then the patient will be placed in advanced airway, then shock, then followed by multiple or multi-organ system dysfunction. So the, uh, the clinicians should be aware of the potential for some patients for to rapidly deteriorate one week after illness onset. So what makes it severe dengue? So Dr. Binale discussed the three reasons due to severe plasma leakage, due to severe bleeding and severe organ impairment. So this is my problem as a critical care specialist during these COVID times. One, waiting and outpatient, waiting time at outpatient and emergency department. So we were thought of how to perform your five-in-one magic touch, your CCTDR, but what if you are, you are in your complete or level four PPE? And remember, a febrile patients get the lowest triage in the emergency department. So patient can develop shock, prolonged shock while waiting to be seen and or waiting for a CBC or rapid test or, classic, or tagging as a COVID-19 suspect to be admitted, okay? So the dengue disease becomes more severe during the waiting period with longer duration of shock. And remember, shock is difficult to be detected without touching the patient because of the patient's good conscious level. So the risk factors for severe illness for both COVID-19 and dengue. So we all know that at more than age 65 and there are underlying conditions are risk factor to become a severe COVID-19. While in infants, Risk factors for severe dengue include, uh, for dengue is less than one year older infant, second, second dengue infection or repeated dengue infection, patients with chronic medical conditions. Now, is it really dengue or is it COVID-19 if you are faced with patient with acute febrile illness? Although similarities between COVID-19 and dengue fever are remarkable in clinical presentations, we thought maybe we would circumvent these problems with a serologic testing. Unfortunately, it is not the case in COVID-19. There have been cases reporting serologic or serological cross-reaction of patients who were thought initially to be infected with dengue virus only to test positive of SARS-CoV-2 infection by your RT-PCR or your swab test. There was a case report um, done by Enrina for, uh, as coronavirus disease of 2019, a mimicker of dengue infection. 
A nurse contracted COVID-19 infection during performing a blood draw from a patient that was provisionally diagnosed with dengue infection. So due to this diagnosis, the nurse does not wear appropriate PPE for COVID-19. So what does this mean? Therefore, when a diagnosis of an infectious disease is not yet firmly established, we believe it is judicious to take additional safety measures by using the appropriate PPE. Especially in the setting of a pandemic in tropical countries, which other diseases might obscure COVID-19 diagnosis. Another study from, by Sadike, where there is an emergence of co-infection of COVID-19 and dengue, which is a serious public health threat. Co-infection of COVID-19 and dengue has already been reported from Asian countries such as Singapore, Thailand, India, and Bangladesh. And the emergence of COVID-19 and dengue co-infection warrants further investigation at country level to understand potential of COVID-19 and dengue outbreaks outbreaks in upcoming post-monsoon months with elevated dengue infections. Another um, uh, study by Sri Manini, they conclude that the study provided the evidence of cross-reactivity uh, cross between dengue virus and SARS-CoV-2, which led to false positive COVID-19 serology and um, among dengue patients. This underscores the importance of a simple and affordable rapid test that is capable of differentiating dengue virus and SARS-CoV-2 with high sensitivity at the early phase of infection, as well as enhancing the laboratory network capacities in the region. So this figure shows how laboratory diagnosis of dengue virus infection established directly by detection of your viral components in the serum or indirectly by serology. The sensitivity of each approach depends on the duration of the patient's illness, as well as when the course of illness the patient presents for evaluation. And the detection of nucleic acid or your viral antigen has high specificity, but is more labor intensive and costly. Serology has lower specificity, but it is more accessible and loss or uh, less costly. Okay, during the first week of illness, detection of viral antigen or your NS1 is typically positive. So, so if prime, in primary infection, the sensitivity of NS1 detection can exceed 90%. So if you have NS1 positive, that's dengue. And antigenemia may persist for several days after resolution of fever. In secondary infection, the sensitivity of NS1 detection is lower, which is 60 to 80%. So in this diagram, your IgM can be detected as early as four days after the onset of illness. The likelihood of IgG detection depends on whether the infection is primary or secondary. So primary dengue infection is characterized by a slow and low titer antibody response. So your IgG is detectable at lower titer, beginning seven days after onset of illness and increases slowly. During the secondary inf dengue infection, it's, it is characterized by a rapid rise in antibody titer, beginning four days after onset of illness with broad cross reactivity. So there's a um, study entitled Low Risk of Serological Cross-Reactivity Between Dengue and COVID-19. And their conclusion was among the 32 COVID-19 positive sera, meaning the patients are COVID positive. They test for dengue, dengue uh, sero serological test for dengue and no positive dengue virus results were observed. On the other hand, one false positive result was observed among 44 dengue patients and for COVID-19 antibodies, which of the two rapid tests used. So further data and accuracy of COVID-19 diagnostic tests are urgently warranted. So your, your nucleic acid amplification testing 
This is the most commonly uh, uh, your RT-PCR, your reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction assay to detect SARS-CoV RNA from the upper respiratory tract is the preferred initial diagnostic test for COVID-19. For many symptomatic individuals, a single negative RT-PCR test is sufficient to exclude the diagnosis of COVID-19. However, if the initial testing is negative, but the suspicion of COVID-19 remains high and confirming the presence of infection is important for management or infection control, we suggest repeating the test. So just like in this picture, so Sally was exposed to a COVID-19 patient. So, so day zero. On day five, she, she got tested and the result came back and it turned out to be negative. So thinking that Sally was negative for COVID-19, she attended school and family cookout and she was contagious days eight and nine. So 48 hours before the symptoms and now exposed to 17 people. So on day 10, day 10, Sally became symptomatic and tested positive. So see the importance of repeating if you have high index of suspicion that this patient may have COVID-19. So this table shows the diagnostic test for COVID-19. So these are the test category and the specimen type that you will use and the performance characteristics of each test including the time to, to perform the test and its turnaround time. And this table shows the suggested priorities to COVID-19 testing. So whether it's high or first priority, second, third, and look at your high priority are those patients that are critically ill or any individual with fever or may, meaning they're symptomatic with close contact with patients laboratory confirmed with COVID-19. So given limited testing resources, some institutions perform targeted testing in the outpatient setting. So for children who are evaluated for symptoms consistent with COVID-19 in the emergency department or urgent care setting, we should perform testing for SARS-CoV-2 if the child has underlying condition that may increase the risk of severe disease, if the patient's known in person exposure to a laboratory confirmed case of COVID-19 within the previous 14 days, and the presentation is severe. So indications for testing asymptomatic individuals include close contact with an individual with COVID-19, but take note of the timing of the testing and post-exposure testing should be done five to seven days after exposure, although the optimal timing is uncertain. So I will not further discuss MISC, but this table outlines the CDC's and WHO's case definition of MISC. So patients who meet this criteria and who also fulfill full or partial criteria for Kawasaki disease should be considered to have MISC and should be reported. In addition, MISC should be considered in any pediatric death with evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And the clinical spectrum of COVID-19 and COVID-19 associated MISC in children or MISC, it is apparent that the spectrum of disease ranges from mild to severe. So the, the understanding of the full spectrum include subphenotypes is evolving. Uh, there, may be some uh, there may be some between these categories. It remains unclear how common each presentation is, how frequently children progress from mild to more severe in manifestations and what the risk factors for such progressions. So in summary, also what you need to know during the COVID-19 pandemic, healthcare providers in areas where dengue is endemic or who are treating patients with recent trouble history to these areas need to consider dengue and COVID-19 
in the differential diagnosis of acute febrile illnesses. Most people with dengue and COVID-19 have mild illness and can recover at home. It depends on, uh, on the set setting and symptoms usually last a few days and people tend to feel better after a week. However, both dengue and COVID-19 can cause severe illness that can result in death. And the clinical management for people who develop severe illness with either of these two diseases is quite different, often requiring hospital-based care. So any, anyone of any age can develop severe illness with dengue or COVID-19. Healthcare providers should perform appropriate tests for dengue fever and COVID-19 and follow the patient closely for warning signs. Complications for both dengue and COVID-19 can develop before test results come back and clinical management should be guided by clinical presentation. Co-infection poses a challenge for accurate diagnosis and treatment, particularly when symptoms such as fever and aches are similar, similar for several viral diseases like your COVID-19 and dengue. So these are the objectives that so I have discussed the importance of knowing similar clinical presentations and pathophysiology of COVID-19 and dengue fever. We know now, we now know the diagnostic tests for COVID-19 and dengue fever, and we should not and already convince you that we should not exclude COVID-19 in the differentials in the setting of a pandemic. Thank you. Back to you, Jackie.